So having spoken about those six different ways to maintain privilege, I now want to focus on 14 different strategies. I'm sure there are many more, but these are just 14 that I've identified that men may commonly use to ward off any challenges to their privilege. The first one is to um, place yourself in a position where you appear, or you may even be quite confident, to give advice um, and directions to others about gender issues. You may not have actually done much reading about gender in society. Um, you may not have um, ever f formally studied. You may have done maybe a half-day workshop on diversity sensitivity. Uh, and yet um, we still find men will place themselves onto committees where they have some degree of, uh, of power and influence uh, without having any real background in the area. For me, this approach is an analogous to, um, say, a airline pilot having done a half-day workshop on um, flying a Boeing 737 and um, explaining that he had a lot of experience with planes. He was very keen on planes as a, as a kid. He's been as a passenger as a plane very often, therefore felt very comfortable, comfortable with planes and so um, just would let the passengers know before they took off that um, he, uh, he does have some training. He has done a half day workshop. Now, it just sounds like a, an outrageous proposition and you, you would imagine the passengers would run screaming from the aeroplane if that was truly the case. And yet, I would argue that understanding gender dynamics, gender discrimination, sexism, patriarchy in our society is much, much more complex than flying a 737. Um, and yet for some reason, um, many men seem to uh, take the view that it's not that difficult and um, can place themselves in positions where they can give advice and direction to others about gender issues with very little or no background in the area. For example, if, um, if you do a, a short search um, around the definitions of gender to, to look at uh, gender theory, uh, you'll discover that there are literally dozens and dozens of completely different frameworks for understanding gender. Um, it's, a, it's a very complex cultural, sociological, psychological, political economy field lots of argument and disagreement, different interpretations, there's mountains of research and it is not a simple field at all and it is definitely not just about counting numbers of men and women. Actually leading on from that, that first strategy of um, just placing yourself in the position of being one who is confident and, and knows is the reverse of that and that is to say look this gender stuff it's just all too complicated for me. Um, I just, I, I, there's nothing I can say about it. And so just to withdraw yourself completely from any discussions or, or if there is a, a committee formed, say that there's no way that you could have anything to do with it because it's just all too complex for you. In a way that's probably a more effective strategy because uh, therefore you're not making yourself accountable in any way. Of course my preferred approach would be uh, that men who are concerned about this issue would uh, take it seriously and actually spend some time to really understand and listen to women and, and read um, feminist analyses so they, they could be informed if they were going to undertake this sort of work. A third strategy for warding off privilege is to simply discredit the source of the challenge itself. So um, very often it is, um, it is women who even perhaps tentatively raise some challenges about um, what's going on in, in a particular meeting or a dynamic and uh, it's uh, quite an effective thing just to say well of course she would say that she's a woman. It's therefore discrediting the source altogether. Or to characterise anything to do with uh, feminism as some crazy, crazy um, feminist plot that's out to undermine all men or or just to, to blame women as being angry or inappropriate. 
So discrediting the source is a really effective way to ward off privilege. This um, uh, approach of uh, attacking the source uh, in rhetorics is actually called the ad hominem uh, argument. That means attacking the person or going against the person. Um, and this can actually uh, place women in a difficult position because um, if women don't raise concerns about uh, the gender dynamics of a workplace, for instance, then they are giving the impression that everything's fine because they're not complaining. Uh, if they do complain, uh, then they're indicating that they can't cope with the workplace. And so it's very easy for the, the men to say, well, clearly there's something about her that means that um, she's not strong enough in the workplace, that you know, she's, she clearly can't handle it. Uh, and so it puts women in a double bind. They know if they speak up, they're going to be dismissed. If they don't speak up, then nothing will change. So very effective technique. I, mean, I hope no men are watching this, by the way. There's two or three different uh, strategies which all centre around the idea of being a reasonable man. So being a reasonable man, so having an, an even, manly tone to your voice, um, is a really effective way to ward off challenges to your privilege. So, um, for example, if a, if a woman were to claim that um, there's, uh, the, the sexual harassment is, is quite an issue within certain areas of, of workplaces, your response can be to, to take it seriously but to ask for evidence. So to say, look, I'm, I'm willing to listen to you, but where's the evidence? Where's your proof for that claim? So it sounds like you're being very reasonable, um, and, but it's a very effective technique because then you send the complainant off to, to gather the evidence and they come back with the evidence. And then, of course, there will always be gaps in that evidence that indicate that it's not quite robust enough. You're still being reasonable, of course, so you ask them to go and collect some more evidence and, um, and, and as it goes on. Another reasonable approach is to, um, is to use the normal bureaucratic structures and processes and policies to ensure th that um, the complaints are processed but never actually dealt with substantively. Um, so there's some fairly convincing evidence that um, organisations that put in place clear um, written sexual harassment protocols, procedures, complaints processes um, result in fewer complaints of sexual harassment. And that may sound like it's therefore effective, but actually um, what the research is showing is that women are much less likely to speak up uh, when those formal processes are in place and that they tend to be skewed towards um, favouring men. And the processes themselves are usually degendered, they're written gender neutrally, um, which is another way of maintaining privilege. So putting, um, putting any uh, complaints about gender power or sexism through formal bureaucratic processes is a very effective way of seeming reasonable uh, and yet maintaining power and privilege. A very reasonable approach is to, um, to say that you, that you understand that the issue is important, that you really personally take on the concerns of, uh, of women. You even might throw in the fact that you've got two daughters yourself, as though that's relevant in some way. Um, but explain that in you know, the real world of the tight budgets, at least for this financial year, we can't prioritise that area. Um, and explain why there are other more important areas to prioritise. Uh, the frustrating thing is that that seems to be what happens year after year, that um, this, this area of dealing with gender issues is taken seriously, but when you look at the budget um, line item for it, it tends to be actually fairly tokenistic. Um, so the man can say he's reasonable, he's taken on, on board, and yet in practice what you, what you end up with is, is a deprioritisation of that through some sort of seemingly rational process. Mm -hmm.